Hello, welcome back to Bald and Board Games. I'm Bald. I'm Bored. And today we're going to teach you how to play Dungeonology by Ludus Magnus Studios. Yeah, so this is our third entry in our Dungeon Month here in April. Uh, so check out on YouTube. We have Tiny Epic Dungeons from last week. We have Clink Catacombs from two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and now we're hopping into Dungeonology. Yes, Steve uh, prefers this over the previous because it is PvP. There is a co-op mode as well. Which we will but, not be doing today. Yes, we will not be doing that today. <laughs> we will have a co-op month at some point because we have a lot of co-op games and they are fun. I think Steve secretly doesn't like them because they're more difficult for him, even though he loses a lot of the games that we play that are. Yeah, I love difficult stuff, games. Like Skyrim just got in the middle and said, I will love the game. I don't know if that's difficult, but yeah, that is co-op. So hey. we'll find out. Yeah, we'll see. But so Dungeonology is a game where you take on the role of scholars and you are trying to collect information on the creatures within the dungeon by collecting information cubes to submit your thesis. The first person to do so will get points for doing so first, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to win. The objective by the end of the game is to have submitted your thesis and to have the most points. And that is pretty much it. So to start off the game, you do have your center tile here, which is your campsite. It's your home base. That's where your minis will start. It is a safe zone during the game. Everyone will have a scholar board, which are all identical except for the color, which will come into play when we speak about randomizer cards. You have your scholar, which you can choose randomly or choose uh, if you would like. The first player will start with one trick card, the second player with two trick cards, third with three, and fourth with four. If you have the expansion, I think it does go up to five and six. Yep. Uh, just make sure you don't have more than your hand limit at the start. But Steve has some stuff over here as well. Yeah. Piles. So yeah. So in the box, there's tons of different pieces and cards and tiles. Uh, what you want to do is just kind of separate them all out. Uh, what I have over here is the three decks of tiles. Uh, you can see the three different colors. They also have a one, a two, and a three on them. Uh, that is the levels of which you're building your dungeon. So the concept is uh, with the base version, there's three levels. With the expansion, there's four. Uh, you're going to be traveling, and sometimes you'll be going up and down staircases as you dig deeper and deeper through this dungeon. Uh, we also have a bunch of small mini decks here. Uh, first one up right here will be your mission cards. Uh, this is an expansion that you would get, uh, but if you play this, you'll have fun different missions to complete as you're exploring the dungeon. As you complete the mission, you grab the card, and you get some extra bonus points at the end. Uh, next deck up here with a little compass on top is a player identification deck. A ran uh, the randomizer deck. Is yes, called. randomizer yeah. deck, where it'll have a little arrow with a gem in it that'll match player boards, and it'll have a color cube in the center. A bunch of different cards will have effects that say pull from the randomizer deck, or the boss may have one that says pull from the randomizer deck. Mm -hmm. uh, so that'll be shuffled up and used throughout the game. And then we take out the... Uh, there are I specific do. cards for the number of players as well within there, so make sure if you do have the expansion content you're playing with more players than just two or three i think or four uh, that you go in and remove the ones that aren't specific for your player count yep uh third deck here with a little d on top uh these are companions and a bunch of other characters that can help benefit you uh, you'll have certain trick cards that look like this that'll say hey you get to take whatever companion uh, and that'll give you that companion some will give you added hand limit other effects and different things that Nick will cover as we get to talk about the cards a little bit more in depth. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we have the Omega deck here, which is our Jinx deck. Uh, in certain circumstances, if you pull a, or do something that requires you to pull a Jinx card, you'll pull one from these decks. A lot of these give you negative points and also have a bad effect on them. Uh, so definitely could change the way you play the game, but sometimes, at least my experience, uh, it's beneficial to take one to at least get something done on the board. Why did you have to take? So, like, certain circumstances, like, hey, you got to make a move or you have to draw a person and okay. take the risk. Yeah, I just I don't remember. Yeah, but typically they're not good. Yeah, usually not <laughs> good, but sometimes you got to do it. Uh, then the other two decks here are the setup for the end game, uh, which we'll see over here. All the way on the left-hand side, uh, you'll see a little board. Uh, you'll have one of these cards. All these do is identify your win condition. Uh, so if you want to submit your thesis... This will help describe exactly what you need to do. And then over here, uh, you'll have your difficulties. So you'll pick one of them. So we have easy, medium, hard, and then the introductory one. Uh, this will just line up some of the different circumstances. 
and what happens uh, when you have to move from, let's, we'll call it stage to stage, mm -hmm. on this little deck. Continuing setup, if you want to come in close to my screen here, so we'll show. So for the character boards, initially what we're going to talk about here is we have this three next to this little guy here. So that means that I start with three of these students, which will be used throughout the game to be sacrificed and do other various things. The board here that Steve was talking about, which is the bonfire board, is where you will house these cards. So this card here is the fauna, the creature that you're trying to collect information on. And so on this card, you have a number of symbols down here, which are going to affect the points at the end of the game, the point total up here, and some other identifiers that you may need to be able to submit your thesis. So there are qualifications to where you'll be able to look at this card, which we will cover in a moment. So that will go face down right there. So no one can see it. It is drawn randomly and put down. So no one will know exactly what you're trying to find or how many points you'll need until you're able to look at that card. Over here, we happen to choose the hard difficulty, very typical for us. And all these cards are the same. So what this card mainly does at first is it dictates how many scholars you will put into the university bag. So here it says a number of scholars times four or four times the number of players. So that means we're going to put in this bag eight of these little gray guys. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We'll go in plus one Omega student, which are these red guys going in. This bag will be drawn from throughout the game. And whenever this is drawn from the students, will go onto the bonfire. If you happen to draw, I'm just gonna grab a bunch here. I did not grab it. The Omega student was in here somewhere. Nope. <laughs> It'll be the first one I draw during the game. It'll be the last one I draw now. My goodness, there we go, I'll just grab them all. So when you draw an Omega student, you'll place them here. It increases the difficulty. So at that point, You'll go through the steps of taking a Jinx card at this point in time and replenishing the bag based on what it says here. So an Omega student will go into the bag. You keep the one on the card. So one will go into this bag. And then it says here three times the number of players. So we remove all these individuals and put in three times the number of players back in this bag and continue playing. That's what that card will do throughout the game. It helps ramp up the difficulty. The card underneath it is not technically needed to play in the base game, but we are playing with the original rules, now considered the advanced rules after the update, which is the maximum alert card. So when you get all of your Omega students on this card, so we'll say we have the first one on there still, and then we end up with one, two, three, and then once you have the last one that ends up on this card here like so, you are into end game maximum alert, you flip this card over and go through the steps on the card to replenish the bag. And there are various effects that change how the game plays. So this is also drawn at random, placed on the board underneath the difficulty card that you chose. Get all those put back over here. Now that is how you set up the bonfire. And we have lastly here, the, whoop, there we are, the boss card. So you can choose this at random. The base game comes with one boss, which is Latus. And Latus throughout the game will just kind of be making things difficult for you. Certain things happen when you land in a space with him, which we'll cover in a moment as well. So just have this close by off to the side. Okay. So next we're going to go over this board and the scholar card. So I've already mentioned that here on the scholar card, where you have your little student and the number three, mine's three, Steve's is four, could be five, could be two, could be one. That's how many of these students you start off with. It's not the maximum amount you can have. You can have more students than that. That's just where you start. Next over to the right, the hand holding the card is your hand limit. So mine is five. That means that I can only end my turn with five cards in my hand. Next, we have movement. 
So mine is three. That means you can move three tiles on the board, which are three spaces during your turn. Uh, that's the maximum that you can move. You have to play cards to do so, don't you? No, no sorry. No, play cards to move extras. The maximum you can move normally is three. You play cards to move additional yeah, spaces. Some that's bonuses all. Bonuses on the card. Yep. Yeah. Which Steve will cover more in depth in a moment. Number three is your intelligence. This number here is the maximum number of cubes that you can obtain during a single uh, study session. So on our uh, boards, on the tiles, you'll see when Steve shows you that there are cubes that will be on the boards, information cubes. So mine being three means I can only ever gather three information cubes in one of those study sessions. Next up is your stun, your stamina. So mine's at two. That means when I take two stun tokens, which are these here, I am exhausted. I have to take what's called the rest action on my next turn, and Steve will cover what that means and how to do that. Next, we have the knowledge combo. So to, one of the first requirements is being able to submit your thesis or being able to look at the card that you're trying to gather information on. Again, that is this card here. Before you can even look at this card to gauge what you may or may not need, you have to get one of these tokens, which is also denoted here. So when you get it, you just place it right there. This means you've collected enough information or the proper information on the creatures to look at that card. That is what this combo is here. So I have two greens and a red, which means I need two green cubes and a red cube. So I'll show you here. This is the combo I would need on my board to be able to collect this token, which then allows me to look at this card at any point in time, which is very beneficial because that allows you to gauge which tiles you should go to, which cubes to collect, because there are modifiers on these cards will affect your points at the end of the game. Over here, we have a little dial that will go down, raising this number from plus one to plus two, three, four, five. And that adds to your stealth value. And Steve will explain uh, what the stealth value is used for when we get into the action phases. The way that this moves down is when you collect enough cubes to hit one of the arrows on your board here. So on the green one, it's the third one up. So the moment I place that third green cube, I'm gonna tick this down, one extra one. If I get to three red cubes, I'm gonna go again. So now I'm gonna add plus two to my stealth value when that's needed. The stars on this board are there to denote various things. So some of these creature cards, you will need a star, much like you see here. We need the red silver star, which is this first one. It's four red cubes up. So once you have that red silver star and 25 points, you can submit your thesis for this card. These stars also are required to submit your thesis. You need at least two of them to be able to submit your thesis. When gaining a star, whoever doesn't have one, so if Steve had just gotten a star and I don't have any quite yet, everyone who doesn't have the matching number of stars is another person. So if Steve has one and I don't, I'm gonna flip over my scholar card to the exalted side. What this does is it raises my hand limit, it raises my knowledge level, it raises how much I can be stunned. Overall, it makes you stronger. The main thing that it really does are in the effects on the card. So each scholar has various effects on both sides, on the regular side and on their exalted side. Not gonna go too in depth in that. You can read them. They state very clearly what they do. Just the things to pay attention to are key words like action, which means that that would be your action that you would do during the action phase. Or there's a lightning bolt, which means you can do it at any time during your turn or somebody else's. I believe that is it for the boards. Yes. So once you have your players, once you have all the decks prepped, ready, shuffled, etc., 
uh, then you can get ready to begin the game. So in order to start the game, there's going to be a variety of phases. Uh, so the way we have it set up here, I'm going to be player one. Nick would be player two. So I, as player one, I'm going to go through those phases uh, in completion, top to bottom. Once I am done, then Nick would go, and it would go back and forth. So the way the thing is structured, and I'll just zoom into my board here, uh, you have a nice player aid, uh, double-sided here. gives you a bunch of information. So if you have cards that have different things, when Nick talks about the card section, that's all right here. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the zone effects, which I'll be talking about in a moment, are on here as well. Uh, so all the information is in front of you. Helps make it a little bit easier as you're deciding what to play. But it starts off with turn phase one is the thesis submission phase. To do this, as Nick mentioned, you must have two stars. And if you've already looked at the card, you must have the requirements on there. So in this case, it was 25 points mm -hmm. and one of the red uh, stars, I believe it was the silver one. Mm -hmm. uh, so once you have that and you know you've counted up 25 points across your information cubes, you can submit your thesis. That becomes your turn action. If you submit your thesis successfully, you are done in the game. Your piece just turns over or comes off the map. Uh, you gain some bonus points for submitting first. If you submit your thesis and it's incorrect, then a bunch of other steps happen, mm -hmm. uh, which we'll get to in a little while. The second step is the rest phase. So on the game board here, uh, the center campsite is where you would go to rest. If, for example, my character was just out over here on a different tile, I became injured or something happened where, boom, I need to rest. I had too many of those stun tokens. I would just claim the rest action. That is your whole phase and your whole turn. You do not get to like play a turn and then go back and rest. Mm -hmm. uh, that has to be done before anything else. Uh, when you rest, there's a bunch of benefits. Uh, one of which is those stun tokens can be removed. A uh, second is if you do have any of these Omega Jinx cards, you can discard one of them during a normal phase unless something else says otherwise. Uh, you also have the benefit you get a redraw up to your hand size and discard if you like. Uh, so normally when you draw up to your hand size, you have to keep your hand or just use it throughout play. Uh, during the rest action, you can discard and redraw up to that number. And you get to refresh the amount of students you have over and available to you. Uh, the next phase is the movement phase. So this is the fun part now. And, just, and really quick for diving in that, just for clarity's sake, you cannot do the thesis and then the rest. Those oh, yeah. first two options are you're choosing whether to do thesis or whether to rest. And now if you do neither of those, you'd be choosing to go yes. into what he's about to explain. Yeah, so thesis, your whole piece comes right off the board. Uh, <laughs> just gone. Uh, so here's the fun part is the movement phase. Mm -hmm. So as you can see, we have the center campsite. So I'm going to say I'm moving first. I'm going to take tile number one here and place it down. So what would happen is right here, all sides are available. On this tile I'm bringing into play, only the two bottom and the two top are available. So I would have to place it in a way like this where it would just come across. Uh, so now you can do this part one of two ways, uh, whatever makes it easier for you. Right here, you can see that the path is not fully complete on both sides. There are little tokens that they give you in the game that allow you to make this into a complete blockage. Uh, you can place those down, or if you just, or someone like Nick and I who just notice, oh yeah, there's not a full connection like there is down here, you don't need to worry about the tokens. Mm -hmm. Once you've placed a new tile down and entered into it, You'll place the information cubes in matching the color. If you happen to run out of information cubes of that color, you place whatever colors you can down, the rest will be left blank. And it initiates endgame. It would. Uh, that would be one of the things we'll, we'll talk about how endgame mm -hmm. triggers a little bit as well. Uh, so for this here, there's no other symbols. So some tiles might have a bunch of symbols, which we'll see in a second. All this has is a number three. So that means if you want to take the first cube, you need to pass a skill check of three. Mm -hmm. Uh, additionally, if you want to take more cubes on your card here, it tells you that. So if you want to go for two cubes, you would add one to that number. If you want to go for three, all three cubes, you'd add three to that number. And I'm not going to explain exactly how to do the skill check yet. Uh, that'll come with the card phase when Nick explains all these cards and fun effects. Can you take any two cubes? No, it has to be cubes? left to right only. Uh, but if I take this cube, left to right now starts at red. Mm -hmm. So red then would become the normal three. Yes. Yeah. 
Uh, so if I made that, let's say that was move number one. I'm like, ah, oh, this tile's not good enough for me. I'm going to go to move number two. So now... You're so picky with your tiles. <laughs> uh, so now I would come down and be like, okay, here's my next tile. Where do I want to put it? Well, what I can do actually is I can put the tile like this. Mm -hmm. As long as it's connecting the way I'm walking, that's perfectly legal. So I would move over here. Three new things would go down. And now we have some fun symbols on top. So symbol one, all the way on the left, is a staircase. That means that the next tile after this one has to be one level higher or one level lower than this. This is level one, so you have to go higher. The B is signifying a secret passageway, where if you find another B somewhere on the map, you can now be able to hop from this tile to that tile or vice versa. And then the third one is the one none of us want to see. <laughs> that is when the monster comes or the big bad boss. Uh, so the first time you see that symbol on any tile, he pops out onto the board. You'll resolve what it says on the monster card, uh, which includes usually randomizing and potentially causing injury. Once you've completed that, every future time you see that symbol, you'll complete what it says on the card for the non activate or for activation, but not for sighting. So I've now moved my two movements, but I have for my character four movements. So I'm going to keep going. So my next movement here <laughs> is uh, this one. And let's say I place this tile down and I'm like, oh, this is a cool tile. It has a green, a red, and a yellow. Maybe I'm looking for yellow. That's why I keep moving. Unfortunately, I cannot enter into that tile. In order to get into that tile, if we could all see it, it'd be great. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. There we go. Uh, if we wanted to get into this tile, you would need to have one red cube already housed. If you were coming from the bottom up, you would need a green cube. Uh, so if you do not have that, the tile still goes down. You've still used your movement, but you can't physically move into that tile. So we'd have to go again. So now we have this tile. Where to play it is the question. Can't play it on this board. We're going to play it here just to show this tile. Well, yeah, so if you can't ever play a tile on the board, and so the reason why he can't play it is because there's no way to orientate yes. it, all of them being the same direction, and have it connect to the tile that you cannot on. play it sideways like this. It always has to be where the cubes are on the bottom. Yep. So when that happens normally, though, you would just place that tile underneath the deck and exactly. draw a new one. Until you get to the point where no tile is playable, then you just forsake that turn. Oh, sick. Uh, <laughs> so we're going to pretend like this tile is now down here uh, for the purpose of our demo. And now we have, again, we have, we'll have more cues placed down. We have another stairs, and we have this little foot marker. That foot marker means your turn is done, your movement turn is done. So you have moved. It says, yep, you got stuck here. Yep took a nap to play the banjo or took a rest to play the banjo here, uh, and your movement is complete. You can still do the actions on the tile, like go for these cubes, you just cannot move any further. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the last movement we'll show one more here is this one. So let's say on my next turn, I started the movement again and moved into this tile. What this tile here allows us to do now is gives us that B. So I can now use a movement to transition from this tile back to this tile. So if during everything, the boss happened to move to the middle, I'm able to just kind of hop right over him and try to run back towards that shelter. Uh, this will become very useful towards endgame yes. uh, when different circumstances have this boss travel at you or if you're trying to avoid the other player as well. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll definitely be beneficial to start hopping around the different cards. So once you've completed your movement, decided either it told you you had to end or you decided where to end, you now can go into the action phase. So the action phase has four possibilities. Number one is called study. That allows you to gain these cubes. So you're going to say, hey, I'm going to do the study action. You have to announce to the whole table exactly how many cubes you're going to attempt to go for. So let's say I'm going to go for one cube. The number is five right here. Uh, so I know I need 
a skill check of five or higher. So then this is where we now look at our hands. We would play a card, which we're going to be using the number in the upper left-hand corner here. So my number is one. I happen to only have one card in my hand uh, because of the first turn. So obviously I would never study the first turn. Uh, but you always gain up to your hand size at the end of that turn. Uh, so I would play it down, but let's just say this number was a five. Nick has the option to counter that, and he can raise this number. So if he had cards to do so, he might have to spend some resources or some students to do it. Uh, but he, <laughs> yes, you do kill off your students. <laughs> uh, but he can add to that number, which would give me a second opportunity to play some more cards. But let's just say for this example, Nick's like, nope, I'm not going to do it. Let's say this number was five. I would then get the cube. It gets added to my tray. That's option one. Option two is espionage, where you can attempt to steal off uh, from another player. I don't know why I put it with the boss, though. Because with espionage, they can be either really in good. your square or in an adjacent one. You probably just don't want to be with the boss, though. No, I was just... I, I, I put it there so you would ask why. No, I knew <laughs> I'm just like, oh, you want to hang out with the boss? That's fine. Yeah, uh, so party. here, I can espionage, and let's say Nick had the example where he had, let's just say, all three of these green cubes. That's right. Got I'm like, star. oh, I can get... And let's say I needed green cubes. I can get one green cube here... Or I can go try to steal one of his because I can see on his board that his green is one point shy of that star. Mm -hmm. And I know that doesn't help me. I don't want him to have stars. So what I would do is I would say, hey, my move is espionage. The number would be associated uh, to what I believe what color it is, correct? Yeah, so it's yes. going to be the, so the that color that it is on the board. So the green is two, so they start off easier to steal. But additionally, it'll be plus however many students you have. So yep. to steal uh, one of my green, and you can only ever steal one cube from a, uh, another player at a time when doing espionage. So to do so, he would have to meet, again, five or higher. Yes, so again, same style. I would play a card first. He can counter it. And then I would play potentially more cards if I need to, to meet or exceed that number. And the, one of the other big differences with espionage is, so typically other players, like you explained beforehand with the study action, every player at the table can add in a card to make it more difficult for you. With espionage, that's not the case. It's purely between you and that other player. Yes. It's like you're dueling it out in the dungeons. Just yep. the two of you. Yeah, knowing you, though, you probably come up behind me and just crack me in the back of the head because you're a coward. Brute you. <laughs> uh, okay, brute. Uh, the, so that's the main two actions that a lot of players will be doing uh, every turn. As they're expanding, they're doing their research and studying to gain all these information cubes to be able to submit their thesis. Mm -hmm. The other action you can do is play trick cards. So a lot of these cards have a bunch of abilities on them. So, for example, the card I have here in front of me, and I'll just zoom in on my side, has a little exclamation point. Just kidding. has a little thunderbolt, uh, <laughs> lightning bolt. So, 0 for 2. Lightning bolt. Sorry, there you go. <laughs> Third time's the charm. Uh, where this part of the effect can be used at any time. Mm -hmm. The bottom here is a separate box. If there was a little lightning bolt down here, I could use this at any time, but that's not the case. So, for here, I can use this on my turn. At any point in time, only on my turn. I could discard one card to draw two new cards. So let's just say I had a second card. I'm like, I don't really need that. I would play this, say, yep, playing it for this effect. I would discard a card, draw two new cards. You can do this step because this does not say the word action on it as part of your normal turn before you study or before you go into that espionage phase. So you can do all of these things at the same time. You cannot study and espionage. Those are, you only have one option of the two. But you can play a bunch of cards to help build your hand at any point in time. And then the final piece is on your turn. Sometimes you'll have different zone effects that'll go into a, and either help you or harm you. So, for example, some of these might have a thing called like divination, uh, which is this one right here. That's not using the zone effect. Well, it's be like if I. Uh, it goes into effect like while you're studying. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so for the example, this tile here, if I was on this tile and I was facing a study action or espionage, I get a negative divination. 
uh, or anti-divination, we'll call it. Uh, what this pretty much means is that on the deck, you take the top card of the deck, you flip it over, place it there. That will now go towards the opponent. Uh, if this number was in blue, it would go towards you. So there's some blue ones out there that's like, hey, this makes my life easier. If I needed a five, I only had four. If I was on a divination spot that was positive, boom, that's almost going to that guarantee you one because most cards at least have a number one on them. Uh, in this case, I would have to now, instead of beating, let's say here, the three, I would need to have a five. And then you have your end of turn. So at the end of your turn, the major things you want to pay attention to is drawing back up to that hand limit right here. So minus four until uh, other cards may add or subtract from that hand limit. Uh, but I would draw up to my four, announce that I have now completed my turn, and then it would then go to Nick's turn. He would start playing, uh, and we'd go back and forth. Also, if for whatever reason you have more cards in your hand at the end of your turn, you have to discard down to your hand limit, your hand yes. limit as well. Yeah, so if I used a bunch of cards that allowed me to discard and draw two, I would potentially at that point have five, six, seven cards in my hand and would have to discard down. Uh, the last thing to take note of is as you're doing this back and forth, let's say I drew up to four, Nick goes and he commits espionage against me, and I use two of my four cards to counter him. I do not draw up to four cards at that point because it's his turn. Mm -hmm. I would have to wait to the end of my turn when it comes back to me to draw up to four. So definitely pay attention to how you're using cards because you're going to need them offensively and defensively. Yeah, that's the balance that you play here is if you decide to hinder somebody else, you're limiting how much you can do on your turn. But it might be worth it. It's true. Also, I believe at the end of the turn phase, you would reveal any jinx cards that you... Had received. Yeah, so uh, for the Jinx card, if you happen to pull that red guy over there, and, yep, so if you happen to pull that little red token guy, he would then require you to draw the Jinx card. So let's just say in front of me I had one sitting here. I can look and read this and know what's about to happen, but at the end of my turn, I have to reveal it to the table and keep it face off until I do that rest action and it allows me to discard it. So, for example, if I end my turn, have this Jinx card, it says, as long as you have this card, a scholar present in your zone can demand a gift as an action. If you do, they must give you an information cube. So the cool thing about this card, on um, our friend group definitely has this issue, is <laughs> I'll let's say we're playing with a group of four. I'll yep. flip this card. I'll read it, do my due diligence that I have to do. Mm -hmm. If someone shares my square four turns later and forgets I have this card, oh, it's yeah. their fault, not mine. I read it. I told you what it is. It's sitting face up in front of me. You're not going to shoot yourself in the foot and be like, oh, yeah, by the way, remember, yeah. you can take a cube from me. <laughs> uh, so that'll definitely happen with bigger groups. Uh, but yeah. as long as you read it the first time when you put it face up, that's all you have to do. Mm -hmm. And now we will move on to kind of talk about when battling, either offensively or defensively, what are a bunch of different cards you could have or even just playing cards? Yeah, so we're going to go into these things called the trick cards. And there is a huge deck of these there are a few more in there than normal because you do have some of the expansion stuff in there which you'll see as i go over the uh the different types of cards here so we'll just go down the list uh, i'll cover some of the basic stuff first on each of the card and then we'll go into the specifics of each card so basics big numbers in the circle like this eight or this four. Those are the same thing as these small numbers in the top corner. So when doing your stealth checks for studying or for espionage, when you have to play cards from your hand to try and reach that value, if you put that down, it would be eight. You can put down multiple cards. So there's a one on the top of these two. So this would total 10. But I'm saying I'm using all of those specifically for those numbers in the top. That is only for the initial stealth value. When it comes to adding to the alert value, so after this card has been put down, we'll say Steve put down the Spriggan for eight, and now I can choose to play a card. I also, before you play that, yep. so if I play this Spriggan for eight, uh, and it's my turn, I also get, I do not, I do not get, uh, so you, this is where you have to balance your you, choice. So this this one's a little bit different. Oh, this what one you're saying, this what you're saying is true, but yeah, I'll go uh, into the, the effects in a moment okay. here as well. So just covering the, the stealth values and stuff right now. So uh, Steve plays this down 
and he will have eight for a stealth value. If I want to add to the alert value, if I were to play down this four here, that four doesn't automatically add it to the alert value. Down here on the bottom of the card, you will have to do something to gain that plus four. So for this, I would have to draw two students from the bag. That's what that means. And you can find that on your handy dandy reference card here where it shows you the icon and what that means. Of course, the ends on these icons always reference the number that's associated on the card. So I would do so, I would draw students from this university bag here, like I was showing you earlier. Now he's gonna draw the red one. Probably. <laughs> nope, we're good. So those guys would just go over into the bonfire and I'm safe. And of course, the more students you draw from the bag, the more likely it is that you will draw a red one causing somebody to get a jinx card. So sometimes it's good to play these to get those students from the bag if I wanna force Steve to draw a red one potentially and get that jinx card. Yep. But it's gonna make the game more difficult for you as well if he does do so. So anyway, that's how you add to the alert value. Just remember, it's always gonna be an effect to do so. You don't automatically get the four. These big numbers and the numbers in the top of the cards are only for the initial cards placed for the stealth value. Now, I played down the four. Let's say that now the stealth value is at nine. Steve is at eight, or sorry, the alert value is at nine. Steve's stealth value is only at eight. He needs to play another card to at least match the nine. So we'll say that he plays this card down here. When it comes back to Steve and he's trying to add to his stealth value again, so this is, again, after the alert value has been raised by other players, now this number in the top corner does not count. He has to go based on what it says in the bottom here. So luckily for Steve, there's no action that has to be taken to play this additional one. He just gets to add that one on because of this little lightning bolt with the plus one. So he could not have played this card. There's a one here, but there's nothing on here that has the stealth mask saying he can do so at this point in time, which is why I played this because it's plus one with the stealth mask. And so that's what those numbers mean that are on here. That can be a little confusing as you get playing for here. When can these numbers count and stuff? So I just want to go over that first. So and now, I was like, always pay attention to your yes. board and everything else. So for example, just quickly zoom in here. Uh, mm -hmm. Since I have three green cubes, I get that arrow. So I automatically get a plus one. Yep. So pay attention to that. You might have little cars and companions that also add on to that stealth value. So make sure you're always aware of where else you're getting those points. Yeah, take your time. It's not. Yeah, there's no turn. <laughs> not time. time. There's no. That would be intense. Did you imagine a little timer just ticking down? <laughs> Chess style. Cards? My goodness. All right. So the different types of cards. So you have these big cards that I've shown you already, which their primary purpose is purely to add to the stealth value or to the alert value. That's it. You have some subterfuge cards. So here, these have a main effect and auxiliary effects down here. So like we explained earlier, if you're doing it for the main effect, which would be played during your turn, if it doesn't say action, you can play more of these cards. If it ever says action, then you are choosing to do that action. Here, you would have to kill off a student. So one of yours, you'd have to kill off. Or whenever there's a slash, that means or pull a student from the bag to do what the effect is. Here, this one says, uh, move another scholar's position in uh, your in the same area. This is an expansion card, the Spriggan, which is the first one I played. So when you play the Spriggan, this is different than most other cards that would give you a companion. Typically, you would have to choose to do the action that gives you the companion. Here for the Spriggan, if you play this card, you automatically get the Spriggan companion card, which gives you points at the end, but the effect says after declaring uh, your stealth value, perform a divination one and add it to the alert value. So this card can actually make your life more difficult. So it's great here for the eight, but not great there afterwards. But it does give you four points in the end, so that could be useful. Could be, who knows? So you gotta really think through what you're gonna be doing. Is that for you? Next we have the notoriety cards. So here we have employee and architect. The notoriety cards are a lot of cards where you'll get these uh, companions from, these interns, they're called. So here we would gain the intern 
architect. And it tells you on here as well what the architect does. So here it has a little shield with the green information cube symbol. And that is repeated on his card here. It has, it says it keeps your green cube safe. So that means nobody can take your green cubes from you as long as you have this architect intern by your side. Beware though, if another one of these cards is played by somebody else and they use the main effect, they can take your architect card. So what does the line in between here mean? Here, if you're playing for the main effect, you would do this main effect up top and if it was written anything else, and then you would do what's below this line here, which is gain an architect. You do not continue on down the card to the what's called auxiliary effect. If you wanted to do this auxiliary effect, which is gain one student, you would play this card for that, not this. You have to choose, are you using this effect or this one down here? Next, we have an alchemy card. This has that lightning bolt on the upper right-hand corner, as Steve mentioned beforehand. So this can be played at any time during your turn or another player's turn. Not the auxiliary effect down here, the main effect. So again, you would do the required task to get the effect in this main area. So again, this lightning bolt up here is for the main effect, not for the auxiliary effect. Next, we have magic. Again, we have two things here. So for magic, this is used during a stealth test specifically. And if you do so and you complete this action at the top, you just succeed at that stealth test. So if you have a high stealth test, you're in an area with a boss, it's late game, you're trying to get three cubes, clutch card. Play that down. Doesn't matter what anybody else plays because they can't play anything. You automatically succeed at that stealth test. Comes with a huge cost though. Yes, you have to kill two of your students and take a stamina token. So okay. weigh your options. Now down here, you can see that lightning bolt next to the auxiliary effect. So here, this auxiliary effect can be played at any time during anyone's turn, but the main effect cannot be played at any time during anyone's turn. The main effect, and specifically because it says stealth test, can only be played during the stealth test and only for a stealth test, be it studying or espionage. Another notoriety card just to show you. So again, lightning bolt. This notoriety card does not have a, an intern that you would gain. It's simply just the main effect that can be done at any point in time or the auxiliary effect that can be done in your turn. Here we have a social card. So most of these social cards have the reaction icon, which is a red lightning bolt up here. These can only be played, so the main effect here, as a reaction to somebody else's action or card that was played. Down here, the regular lightning bolt follows all the same rules as beforehand. It can be played at any point in time during anyone's turn for that auxiliary effect, not for the main effect. So again, upper right-hand corner, the symbol is specific to the main effect. Here we have a specialist. So functions the same way as the earlier notoriety card I showed you where you would do a thing and you would get an intern. This one is the uh, porter. And while you have him by your side, you gain points like normal, but you also gain one extra to your hand limit. So very handy to have him. By far my favorite one of the companion cards or specialist cards. Yes. And are these? Yep. Yeah. So then here on the bottom, this can actually be played to increase your uh, stealth value. So stealth is uh, plus however many of these intern cards you have. So these are very special cards, these specialist cards. So worth using for that auxiliary effect on here. Now this card can be a little confusing. There isn't a lightning bolt next to this, like there typically would be for any kind of stealth check that's being done. Uh, so I would imagine that you would have to play this for this effect to add stealth. Do you, so with this, I think it's the initial action. So you get the, the one instead of using plus, the plus that, right? Yeah, because that's the stealth value, right? Yeah. Okay, that's so what that I was would be your initial. Well. But you can't play it as like 
If, the, he, if I play, he goes. If I'm trying to boost even higher, yeah. I can no longer play that card because it does not have the lightning bolt or the lightning bolt or uh, the little signal. Oh, yeah, specifically lightning bolt. Yeah, it would have to be the lightning bolt. So that is just saying that that one, you have, if you have two of those in turn cards, you would add two to the one value that was on that card. Right? Yeah. Here we have another social card. So this social card doesn't have that reaction symbol. So here, this follows all the same rules of use this on your turn and do what it says or do the auxiliary effect, but again, only on your turn. No lightning bolts on that card. And then here we have exploration cards. So these cards specifically, uh, and only these cards I believe, have this auxiliary effect at the bottom, which is the boot icon, the movement icon. So once you've moved your movement value during your turn, if you play this for its auxiliary effect, you can move an additional space based on the number that is in that little area. If you instead choose these for the main effect, you can do so as well. And it has its various things. Again, it'll be detailed on the cards. And uh, lastly, we're just gonna cover uh, a bunch of these symbols that are down here. So the symbols you have, again, the lightning bolt is instant. It can be played at any point in time. The red lightning bolt is a reaction card. It's played as a reaction to somebody else's card or action. The green little guy is gaining that number of students. The foot is movement. The green card is gaining trick cards. So green is always gaining. The yellow uh, student coming out of the bag means you have to draw that many students from the bag. So yellow is that kind of middle tier, like it's not great, but it's not bad. Then when you get down to the red, these are bad things to happen to you. So the scrolly student is to sacrifice that many students the stun I, uh, symbol is to take that many stun tokens. The card of the slash through is discard that many trick cards from your hand. And you're not going to be drawing back up after that unless it says to do so. And then, of course, the mask is your cell symbol. The eye is the alert value be adding. And then lastly, that um, crystal ball is divination, which could be good or bad based on the color of the number that's next to it. Red means when you draw the top card from the trick deck, it's gonna get added to the alert value. If it's a blue number next to divination symbol, when you draw the top card from the alert deck, it's going to be added to your stealth value. Now, something of note, if there is a number two or higher next to a single crystal ball, that means you would draw two or however many trick cards and you would use the highest number drawn, not every single one. If you have two separate crystal ball icons on your card with numbers next to them, that means you would do two separate divinations. So if I had a one divination and then a one divination, I would draw two cards and I would add both of those to the stealth or alert value. And that is all of the card types and effects. There's a lot there. Definitely use your reference card. Definitely refer to the rule book if you need assistance on how to use those. Yep. And then the final piece of the puzzle. So now you understand how the board works, moving around. Again, the cards will tell you what to do. The tiles will tell you what to do using that sheet that Nick was just showing. Mm -hmm. uh, your person, you'll continue earning cubes. Uh, let's say you've gotten to the point where You've already checked out the card. You know what your thesis requirement is. You have the necessary stars and the necessary amount of points, and you decide to submit your thesis. What that does is it trigger. It doesn't necessarily trigger end game. Uh, it may depending on the circumstance. Uh, but you'll submit your thesis as long as you pass that number. You get ten bonus points if you're the first one to do so. Uh, you also are kind of putting a time limit on other players to say, hey. You're not going to get as many points I did because I was first, but they might have more time to explore and can get more cubes. So definitely uh, submit your thesis at kind of the perfect time. Don't submit it too early or it'll give other players significant time to just blow past you in points. Yep. Uh, with the, the self test, something we didn't cover was what happens if you fail. So if That's you true. fail at a self test, you have to draw a student from the university bag. And you have to take a stun token. Yes. And that is uh, all stealth tests where you're yes. the offensive side. So if you are studying, if you are the one committing espionage, uh, that has to happen. 
okay. And then also uh, for espionage, and it's, again, it tells you on this little sheet, you do have to sacrifice a student to commit espionage. So not only are you trying to steal someone else's, but you have to get rid of one of your students as like bait to go take one of their tokens or information cubes. And then, so Steve is covering end game. I do have the rule book out here because it is kind of complicated uh, for end game. So definitely refer to the rule book. So the initial thing for end game, of course, which we kind of covered briefly is uh, the first, per first person successfully submitted their thesis triggers the start of end game and what starts to go down from there. It details in the rule book what happens in that situation. So I'll let you read that just so you're very clear on that. The next would be an Omega student is drawn from the bag and there's no more places to put it. So again, that's what I showed earlier where I put it on the uh, the base cards. Essentially, it's the fifth Omega student drawn from the bag is going to trigger end game. And uh, lastly, if there are no more information cubes of a color that have to be placed on the board, that would also trigger end game and get you going from there. So all of these have uh, specific things they do from the card that the student gets placed on to running out of cubes to the thesis being successfully submitted. So for the rule book to see what happens with that. And it may vary based on the uh, villain that's out. For endgame scoring, this can be complicated. It confused us majorly Mostly, no. at start. No, <laughs> all three of us, myself, Steve, <laughs> and Brian, and we played our first time. So what you will do, First, I'm going to read this verbatim from the rule book for you. Add the points of the information cubes on your note board. So the total obtained from each cube is indicated by the number visible above the cubes placed inside it. Yes. So right here, if we're looking at my board, at the very bottom, it does have a number. Mm -hmm. uh, so the first step is it says add the ones from inside. Yep, so it says the number that's above, yep. yep. So in this case, right above my green, it's 6, plus 6, right above red, plus 12, plus 5, plus 6. So I would start off... Oh, okay, uh, I have one. Oh, sorry. Uh, so you start off by adding those numbers together. So I would have 35 to start. But then that number's going to add and go down as... Exactly. So now it says, apply the modifiers indicated in the clan card... Should be on the clan card, sorry... Uh, for each individual information cube in your possession. So that's this card here. Again, that's the card you'll be peeking at to try to figure out if you can submit your thesis. So here it says for green, plus one. For yellow, plus one. For purple, minus one. So you'll only just count up your cubes and commit that number. So I already had, I said 35 to start. So I would add three, add four, minus one. So these two would cancel out. These would just add three. So I would go up to 38. Next, the first scholar who submitted their thesis, as Steve said previously, gets 10 bonus points. Second would be 7, 3rd, 5, and 4th, 3. So important. While endgame is triggered after the first person submits their thesis, that does not stop the other players from being able to do so as well. Just time is starting to run out to do so. Yes. So Steve would get 10 points for submitting his first. Next, you would add any bonuses from intern cards... Uh, so right here, if I had that porter, I would add the one point in the upper right-hand corner. And then you would subtract penalties from any jinx cards. And that's the minus three right here. Uh, so this would be a minus two overall between the two cards added together. Uh, so overall, if I had this, I would have, uh, let's see, 46 points. So not too shabby. All right. And if for whatever reason or somehow there is a tie, there are three tie breakers. First, it would go to whoever submitted their thesis first wins if neither of those individuals are the person who submitted their thesis first. Uh, whoever has the most students wins from that point or whoever the youngest player is wins. <laughs> and uh, if you match all three of those, then you can just fight it out. Yeah. Uh, so there are two other important things to pay attention to, especially if let's say you're the first one submitting your thesis. Uh, number one is once you've submitted your thesis, your board is locked. So other players cannot come in and be like, hey, you ended your game like three turns ago. I'm going to try to espionage you. Your player is off the board. Any cards that say like this vow of generosity, take from another player, does not count anymore. Mm -hmm. They cannot take your cubes. Uh, another thing that will happen uh, when paying attention to the count here is if this were to happen here where I filled that whole green track, there's a plus number at the very top. 
that is your boost now. Mm -hmm. So normally, if I had seven of the eight, I would only get 14 points because each one's worth two times seven, that'd be your 14. But if I went through all that work and got all of them, you actually get 26 now. So that's what that number is on top. So specifically for some of these end ones that require less, it is harder to get them, but it might be worth in the end to get that boost of an extra five, 10 points that you normally wouldn't have. That's right. All right, that was a lot of information. Definitely refer to re, refer to and read the rule book as well. Uh, this is our best way to kind of go over the rules as quickly as we can, as clearly as we can based on our understanding, because we do know that reading rule books alone can be confusing, so it does help to have somebody explain it to you. If you want to see this in action, then tune into our playthrough which you can find on our channel as well. If you're watching this, the moment that we uploaded it, in a couple hours, you'll see that playthrough come through. So the best way to stay tuned and informed is to subscribe and click a little bell to get notifications on when we upload our content. Yep. Well, thank you for joining us here as we taught you how to play Dungeonology by Ludus Magnus Studios. This is Bald and Board Games. I'm Bald. I'm Bored. We'll see you at the table.